everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, as you can see from the panoramic view, I am on this uh, beautiful property known as Husick Estate. Make some really incredible estate wines, uh, as well as some other wines as well that I'm uh, anxious to share with you. I'm honored to be joined with winemaker Mike Furby, and uh, we're going to briefly go through the uh, wines. They all have a great story to tell, and uh, we're anxious to uh, share them with you, talk about them, and um, uh, let's just let's jump right into it. So we're starting off with the 2017 Chardonnay. Uh, Mike, what can you tell us about this? Yeah, um, I really I love making Chardonnay. Uh, I find that uh, every site has a different story to tell, and uh, we sourced this from a vineyard at Dutton Ranch, which is a pretty famous uh, grower in, in far west Sonoma County. Um, they were pioneers at planting some of the best sites um, in West County. And uh, we're lucky enough to source this from a vineyard called Sullivan, which was planted around 1980 to Old Wenty clone. And Old Wenty is just a, a phenomenal clone. It provides everything you want uh, out of Chardonnay with a lot of citrus, a lot of tropical fruit, um, but a wonderful balance. Um, it gives you that kind of hybrid uh, California burgundy thing that that we love so much. And um, the winemaking is is uh, old world inspired and uh, quite traditional. Uh, it's barrel fermented and uh, goes through malolactic completely. Um, the wine's unfiltered. And uh, we just think it's a really, really interesting vineyard to work with. with a- without getting into the whole political side of... Um- Chardonnay winemaking, you have the buttery, rich, creamy, oaky style, and yeah. you have the really crisp, chibli style. Um, I love this wine because I think it walks the tightrope right in between. Uh, there's definitely a rich mouthfeel, but there's zinging acidity to this wine, which, uh, man, this is delicious. It's a great way to start the day. <laughs> uh, I love it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's something that happens really naturally with these with with this fruit, and it's really important to us that you know we work with the farming to provide that balance so that, you know, we never end up with something that's ponderous or heavy or something that is, is harsh and astringent and, and just too much, you know? So, um, I, I love this vineyard cause it provides that balance. The farming is top notch. Um, and the site naturally is a great producer of Chardonnay for sure at Dutton ranch. The production on this is pretty minuscule. Yeah. Generally there are, 10 to 12 barrels of, uh, of Chardonnay that we have. So wow. you can count them on your two hands pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's about 200 cases, 250 cases or so. And um, man, that's um, that's delicious. And it's three years of age on it. So it's showing really, really well right now. Um, I forgot to mention that, I think I did, we're on this beautiful estate up, up here um, in Stagsley. Uh, we're overlooking, you can see behind me here, um, we're just above Clodeval and Chimney Rock. But on a clear day, you can see all the way to the city. It's a really dramatic view. Um, really panoramic, really spectacular. It's really awful to be here right now. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the site of the uh, of the estate Cabernet Vineyard as well. Right. So the Chardonnay, um, we're going to go through the Rosé and the Pinot Noir um, are not estate, uh, but the uh, the Cabernets uh, both are. But um, uh, the Chardonnay, well, it's, I'm thirsty now. I'm ready for some more wine. So we're gonna move uh, on to our next wine, which is uh, rosé. Um, while I'm pouring that for us, you want to tell a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the rosé is a is a rosé of Pinot Noir. Um, it's made in a in a Sanier style. So it's, we're making uh, red Pinot Noir from Sonoma Coast from another great vineyard that we'll get into in a little bit. And uh, as soon as the fruit hits the tank, we bleed off a little bit of juice um, in order to concentrate the red wine a little bit. And the result is like a really, really fragrant, very lightly colored, uh, floral, mineral style of, uh, of rosé. Uh, made a whopping single barrel uh, of it this year. So we have about 22 cases um, in 2019. It was bottled uh, about a month ago at this point. And um, we'll be ready for spring for sure. I'm sure as soon as everyone gets out of their homes, they're going to need... Uh, that pool and porch wine. If you can find it, geez, you said yeah. one barrel, 25 cases. One, one barrel, 20, we got 22, one barrel wow. on the lose. So um, I don't know if you can get a sense of the color or not uh, on screen here, but uh, the beautiful sort of light salmon. 
How would you describe it, Scotty? Very floral. Um, almost like, I don't want to say fresh potpourri, but fresh flowers, but not just one flower, a lot of flowers. Yeah. Um, there are, uh, there are four different clones of Pinot Noir in our single barrel <laughs> and, uh, from a hillside with uh, far, you know, west facing hillside with the top of the hillside ripening a little bit earlier than the bottom of the hillside Four clones. So there's a lot of natural diversity. Here. Wow. In one barrel. In one barrel. And this was a this was an oak barrel for about uh, three months, but a, but an older French oak barrel. So okay. so four four years old, you would never get the sense that this is oaky in any way. No, not at all. Super floral, fresh, crisp. Oh man! Oh, that's that's awesome. That's congratulations. Well. I, I know I'll be buying a case of that for myself. <laughs> There's only 24 cases left, people. Um, that's, wow, that's really special. 25 cases, that's just. Yeah, it's something we make, you know, because we're passionate about it and uh, we love it. And, um, you know, it's, it. There, this is a site that makes great rosé, right? Sometimes you're trying to make uh, rosé out of something that, you know, is a big, you know, ripe Napa cab or something. You know, uh, you might do it and then find that it's just not anything. That Cabernet you doesn't really want to be rosé. That's what I've kind of experienced, but Pinot absolutely does. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a natural. I think this is really shows the 2019 vintage too. I mean, we, we're lucky in California. We're just, we're blessed with straight, you know, vintage after vintage that is unique in its own way, but almost always high quality. Right. But 2018, 2019, sort of back to back have a lot of special qualities. I think they lead to that kind of freshness that you're tasting in this wine. Yeah, this is, uh, that's addictive. That's, that's incredible. It's, uh, that's awesome. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, our Pinot, but um, both first two wines, I mean, this is awesome. <laughs> this is, I'm enjoying this. It's, what time is it here? It's 10.30? <laughs> this, this is how we start our days. Uh, you know, I think that uh, that's a rosé break time, right? Mm -hmm. 10.30? Yeah. 10.30. All right, I'm going to pour the Pinot for us. Yeah, like that, that's a bottle that will just disappear in a hurry, I think. Yeah, you go through a few bottles and yeah. you don't even know it. I have to give a quick shout out to um, the Corvin guys. We're using the Corvin Model 11 today, which is uh, pretty awesome. <laughs> Makes everything real easy. amazing the thing is positively like base aged oh, right. and works perfectly all right so we are on the 17 17 all right so uh 2017 pinot noir uh stop it from <laughs> sonoma coast uh this is from a vineyard uh, farmed by a gentleman named Peter Lynch. Um, wonderful, wonderful man. And um, he inherited this vineyard that his father planted with Warren Dutton uh, around 1990. And um, this is the early wave of Dijon clones coming to California via Oregon and being planted for Pinot Noir in uh, West County. Wow, that's an opposite route that you would think. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of a lot of buzz in Oregon at that time about Pinot and what could be done. And, and Dijon clones came in and they were earlier ripening, which is perfect for um, the Oregon climate. And um, and people started planting them, experimenting with them here. And they were the Dijon clones are a handful of clones, maybe ten that were selected by the University of Dijon out of uh, hundreds or perhaps even thousands for just being exceptionally high quality. Uh, so this is uh, four different clones. This is a punch in the face aromatically. You don't even really have to put your nose in it. You just, even from a few inches off the glass, you're getting these really just powerful aromatics, both fruit, spice, uh, once again, floral. Again, kind of rose petals and things like that on this. It's a, it's a really pretty wine. This is uh, this is a vineyard out there in the Redwoods, right? West of Grayton, almost to Occidental. Oh, wow. Um, really planted in essentially pure sand, Gold Ridge soil. West facing, so it gets those cool breezes off the ocean, which 
it allows the grapes to hang on to all the floral spicy characteristics really well. It gets the late afternoon sun. Um, and it does get the late afternoon sun. Yeah. Uh, no stem inclusion on this. This is all fruit. Yeah. There's a, I want to say this. It's not vegetable, but it's a spice. It's a, there's a, like fresh cut stem kind of thing that I'm, I'm picking up. That's I, yeah. I mean, I love with food, obviously with salads and all kinds of stuff. But the the punch of, of floral and fruit is just really, it's awesome. I, I just always find that in this wine, every year there's just an inherent complexity, right? And you even get that in the rosé, right? right. There's, there are really ripe elements. You get those dark cherry kind of um, richer, riper elements. If you if you like more flavorful Pinot Noir and mm -hmm. you're a fan of California Pinot Noir and at the same time there's there's that aromatic complexity right and it's not really something that I do <laughs> this is really something about like trying to respect the fruit and respect the source and so we we just use really gentle handling to make sure that we're not destroying any of those more delicate elements make sure that we capture every possible thing that the vineyard gives us and put it in the bottle. I, I think that you nailed this is a, a delicate touch of Pinot Noir it's not one of those highly extracted milk alcohol um, dark um, Pinot's expressions of Pinot. This is um, kind of a, a really light, delicate, and just, it's delicious. Thank you. I love how this, uh, I think of this too, like having that lightness, right? Of a little bit of color and more aromatic style, but then the intensity of flavor is always really great too. And maybe that comes from, you know, mature vines at uh, 30 years old. Well, on the, on the palate too, it is, it encompasses your whole tongue. It's, I mean, the fruit, the sour, bitterness, everything is just harmonious. It's that's a that's a delicious expression. Gosh, I'm going to be buying more of this wine than, well, hopefully not any more than our our viewers, uh, but I'm going to get some of this as well. This is and the rosé and the chard. I mean, this is a small vineyard too. We we work with about uh, two and a half acres. Oh. Um, at Peter Lynch's vineyard. Did we say the production on this? Um, it varies year to year, pretty pretty wildly, but generally, you know, these older vines are giving us about two and a half to three tons per acre. Okay. So we're we're in that two hundred fifty case range. Yeah. Another typically tiny tiny production. Wow. As you can see, I'm not using my spittoon very much because these wines are too good. You're being very uh, good about using it, but. Hmm. going to be a long day. I got to go rack a bunch of barrels at the winery. So uh, work, you know, work is still like, being yeah. done out here. Yes. <laughs> um, so we're going to um, move on to, I wouldn't say what the Husics are known for, but they're probably, it is what they're known for. They're Cabernets. Um, and there's two unique stories about these two wines that uh, uh, they're both from the estate here, which uh, as I mentioned, we're on this um, beautiful hillside on the Eastern side of Napa Valley, um, uh, the Vaca range. Yes. And uh, so we're facing uh, west, so we get the late afternoon sun, and it's just a spectacular property. And uh, the soil types and, and the two vineyards, uh, I can't wait for Mike to uh, describe them, but while he's uh, talking about the first wine, I'm going to go ahead and pour that one. Okay. Great. Yeah, this is a, the Husic Estate Cabernet Vineyards are really a really special place. Um, you know, Napa Valley, it's pretty tough to plant on the steepest hillsides. and um, Frank and Julie were able to get the last permit before the hillside ordinance was put into place, uh, protecting steeper hillsides in 1996, I believe. And um, anyway, really, really amazing spot, extremely rocky. Um, the, the bottom portion of the vineyard is in the Stag's Leap District, but this vineyard didn't exist when Stag's Leap District boundaries were drawn. And so uh, sadly, I think all of it would, would be in the Stag's Leap District um, if they were to ever redraw the boundaries and it shares a lot of characteristics with Stag's Leap um, But we're slightly higher elevation and I think that brings a little extra sunshine to the wine and, and to the fruit and a little extra power and the west facing hillside just captures that afternoon sun so well Soils are extremely rocky um, it, it almost seems like extreme is an understatement. I mean, there's a, lo a lot of parts of the vineyard that are just purely rock um, There's a few bits of Pockets of, of red bacon clay, which is a famous soil type you find on Pritchard Hill or at some other very famous wineries that, uh, um, you know. Oakville floor. 
<laughs> yeah, local floor, local <laughs> Eastern Hills. <Yep. laughs> and we're actually not that far far from there. Um, and this vineyard, as far as bug break and flowering, really tracks with those sites as well. Um, Oakville. I hope I poured the first. So I poured the uh, 2016 Palm Terrace. Okay. Which, yeah. um, as you can see, Mike is perfectly modeling this uh, bottle <laughs> as he sits between food, two palm trees here on the property here, uh, which worked out just poetic justice. So 2016. Okay. Yeah, this is Palm Terrace. So at the State Vineyard, we have we have two blocks. We have what we call the terraces and we have what we call Julie's Knoll. And um, they're, you know, a few hundred yards apart. Um, they share a lot of a lot of similarities, but um, but there are also some differences. Um, the terraces is all clone seven, and then Julie's Knoll is uh, three three seven and clone seven. And so we have a little bit of diversity to work with, and then the soil types are different um, as well. And there's it's the terraces has a spot that's so rocky that it was uh, we were unable to even plant it. Um, Julie's Knoll has a lot of fractured rock um, in order to get the vineyard developed. And now I think you know both sites are great as the root systems have developed, and you know over time. They're just digging down into that rock, pulling up minerality and sappiness and giving the wines a longer finish. So um, Palm Terrace is almost always a blend of the 337 from Julie's Knoll and uh, the lower part of the terraces, although it often will have a little bit of the Clone 7 from Julie's Knoll as well. Um, all estate farmed, uh, really high quality parcels uh, on the property. In 16, um, spectacular vintage once again. Uh, uh, everybody's just ranting and raving over these wines and it's, I think it's very um, justifiable. I think these 16s are, you can put them away or you can enjoy them now. Uh, if you have patience, you will be rewarded. But uh, if you don't, it's fine, drink them. We're gonna make more, right? I mean, <laughs> there's more in barrel. So uh, absolutely, yeah. drink and enjoy and if you find that you like it, crack up another bottle, but if you, uh, if you have patience, definitely will be reported, as I said. But um, yeah, this is Cabernet country, and uh, Mike's obviously an expert. Uh, you're how many years making wine now? Uh, 20 years. 20 years. Geez. 20 years, yeah. Blown by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's some really prestigious uh, labels. I mean, uh, I'm sure you've heard of Realm and uh, D.R. Stevens, May's um, Relic, of course, your own wine, which is killer, killer wines. And there was one more that you mentioned that I. Uh, Soroka State Soroka, for the last right. 10 years. Yeah. Right on Spring Mountain. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, 16s are just really amazing to me. They seem like a like a softer, more aromatic version of 2013, almost like a little bit more approachable, but right. they have all that complexity and uh, Staying power, and gravity. Yeah. yeah. Would you say that 13 is probably one of the most ageable vintages that you've seen in the past 10 years? I find them to be I think so. pretty large and, and well structured, built for the long haul. Yeah. Uh, for people who um, palates are pretty accustomed to Cabernets, I think you're going to love them. But for a lot of people like myself who really like aged wines or 10 year old Napa cabs, this is a, that's a 20 year wine. I mean, those 13s are going to go a long, long time. They're so big. for you to say that about the 16, but they're still approachable, it's a big deal. That's really how I, how I see it right now and how I see the wines developing after you know a couple of years now in bottle and this is going approaching two years in bottle at this point right, right. a year and a half yeah a little more than that once again the mouthfeel on this is just it's all encompassing it's just so the fruit is very prominent the acidity is prominent the tannins are i mean just soft uh but angular i mean they're just it's the finish is still going and i've you know had this i've swallowed 20 seconds ago so this is this is a great great covering this is awesome and this does have a little bit of the stack sleep fruit in it as well from the lower terraces. And um, I think it I think it always shows in this wine, right? And that sort of graphite characteristic, yeah. right? And that, that stoniness. Uh, Graphite's a good, a great term I use a lot for mountain cabernets, definitely grown in rocks. I think that's one of the characteristics that you pick up. But as opposed to valley floor, not really getting a lot of that minerality as you do in mountain fruit. Yeah, I think that's great, actually. Yeah, great, great point. Mm. And especially when these vines get older, right? I think that makes a big difference. You know, young vines can be great for providing really fruity wines, right? Very expressive wines sometimes. And after, you know, the first few years, they start to bring on a little more depth and that sort of thing. But that that real complexity of the legendary, legendary wine 
Yes. Always comes from older, mature vines. And I mean, we were hunting for that. It's just a couple of miles, you know, uh, north of us is, I mean, Schaefer and the Hillside Select. Essentially the same soils. I mean, right there. Yeah. And this is, um, yeah, it's, it reminds me a lot of those wines. And I've been a big fan of those. And, and the old Staxley uh, wine cellar wines as well. SLV, Fay, Cast uh, 23, all great stuff. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't had some Staxley wines lately, then come back. <laughs> They're delicious. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the next Cabernet. Okay. Two thousand fourteen, uh, yeah, Husic Estate Cabernet, a um, couple of years longer in the bottle, and um, another really, really wonderful vintage, long growing season. Um, that kind of perfect Napa Valley, moderately warm season without a lot of crazy heat spikes um, and without uh, really too wet of a spring. So we had you know wonderful flowering in two thousand fourteen. Great wines. All around. Yeah, I think um, you know, a lot of people are selling some um, some of their 18 Cabernets already. I think it's um, really special to have something that's got six years of age on it. I mean, it's 2020, this is 2014. And once again, another spectacular vintage. Yeah, I think the 14s have shown also like a, a lot of complexity. This is not like a fruit bomb vintage, right? No. Really, yeah. Um, I've been finding that I think the tannin structures are a little bit softer. I mean, not just because of the age, but because of the vintage itself. Um, these are so soft. You go through bottles of 14 quick because they're just, I like to say they have a high poundability factor. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. So people say, oh, yeah, the, what's the best wine you had tonight? And that's always, you know, the first bottle drained, yeah. right? <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm getting a little bit more red fruit and softer nuances on this one. Is that typical of these two wines that Palm Terrace to be a little bit more espresso or, 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 uh, or minerality and, and structure? And is this supposed to be a little bit softer or do I have a reverse? Um, it really depends on the year. Really, for me, it's really about those extra, the Husic Estate Cab is really about the extra layers of depth, complexity, and length. Um, I'm really finding that this wine is like, so has a, a more palate staining finish, right? You're really you're chewing this wine for a while mm. after it's in your mouth, and um, part of that, it, part of the magic of that is always the Clone Seven off the top of the mill. Um, this is the essentially you know a mountaintop of volcanic rock and aggregate um, above above bedrock. And it, it gets so beautifully ripe. And I think there's a sort of dark chocolate element that comes out of that site. And also the top of the terraces where you have a little outcropping of red rocky clay, Aiken series, um, which provides just a little bit more color too. And, and just like palate standing length. I want to retract what I said because I'm, yeah, I'm still chewing on this wine. Aromatically, I think is where I was getting that. But on the palate, that's a, that's a bold expression to Cabernet. Um, even compared to that that 16, um, that's a that's that's a really intense version of, of Cabernet. Yeah, there's just always a lot of richness in sort of the the heart and soul of uh, of the Husic Estate cabs. Wow. Well, it's, it's probably what 50 degrees. I keep getting shivers. Uh, a little bit, so I got my jacket on here, Scotty. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I got this uh, opportunity, my my cellar gear. <laughs> yeah, you 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 dressed appropriately. That's well. Relic is just around the corner, so um, oh, yeah. uh, you know we're racking outside after this. So yeah. oh, so it's going to be just as chilly over there. Pretty yeah. much, I think. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Right. So this is a. Uh, we kind of know too the different parts of the vineyard and what they what they need, and so the Husic Cab is also um, almost always in 100% new oak, um, great barrels from Terenceau, from from Hermitage, from Bosque, and uh, that is really like kind of the essence of this wine too, and it helps. We you know we we sort of look at wood in terms of the you know the natural quality of the fruit and how much power it has, and we try to match that with the amount of new oak. The idea being we're never trying to make oaky wines, but we're trying to 
provide that structure for longevity. Um, and we just hope that the oak disappears and, and provides, you know, more aromatics and longer finish. And more well, tenting. when you're given intense fruit like this, yeah, I guess you have to do that. That's uh, one of the great things about, I admire about winemakers is that um, y'all are able to read a crystal ball. And, you know, just because you've been working with this fruit for so long, you know what type of oak program it needs. And as you're tasting, as the wines are aging in barrel, you're, you 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 can read the crystal ball. Oh, the five years. This is what this wine will taste like. So, this is what you intended six years ago. That's what we're trying to do That's all the incredible. time, Scotty. It's, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, well, those are both spectacular. I mean, really, really delicious. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one you. more wine to taste, which is uh, uh, the late harvest wine, um, which uh, you, you don't, don't find in Napa very Napa. often. Um, and I'm sure, sure the production on this is minuscule as well. So, um, uh, yeah, let's get into that one. Absolutely. This wine is is so much fun to make. You know, as a winemaker, you're lucky if you get, you know, 40 or 45 vintages to even make wine, right? And that's 40 or 45 tries in your lifetime, um, which is really not very many when you think of it. You know, I'm jealous of, of my chef friends who get to try new ideas every Friday or Saturday night, you know, all year long. And... Uh, Although we're feeling for them right now, um, I know they're cooking some really great meals at home. So, um, so to be able to make a large number or a large variety of wines across a big spectrum is is really valuable experience as a winemaker and just a ton of fun. And this is one of those wines. So this is Late Harvest Semillon uh, from the Santa Elena Appalachian, um, working with the grower there who's got some beautiful, beautiful Semillon planted in pure, pure volcanic ash. And it happens to be a spot that um, does get botrytis um, almost every year. And so this is a late harvest style, botrytis uh, semillon, uh, fermented and aged in um, older French oak barrels. So you get a little bit of that richness and creaminess from the wood, but you would never know that there's there's no cedar or, or no overwhelming vanilla elements or anything. Um, uh, well. Really inspired by you know by the old world winemakers and again like we're just trying to give it a hands off approach you know now this is not a techni technologically made wine right this is really the old way um, fill the barrels let them ferment to where they want to stop and when the yeast decide they're done then they're done just take care of the wines and try to be led by them so late harvest for Semillon what what dates are you kind of is that October, early November, early November, typically wow. early to mid November. So, and that's uh, really risky for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Uh, I mean, rains, obviously, uh, rot. Um, well, botrytis is rot kind of thing, but yeah. Um, is it, is the botrytis happen naturally in the vineyard or is, wow. It does. Crazy. Yeah, it does. It's a really special place. Um, there it's below, it sits below a, a dug fir forest. And so there's a little natural humidity that is always coming out of that forest and, and really promotes that aspect. So the noble rot can happen, the botrytis. And um, we actually work with the site to pick two or three times always to make sure that we're only picking the botrytis affected clusters wow. and uh, instead of just picking an entire block at the same time. So it's a lot of work, very expensive to do. Um, there's a lot of care taken and uh, the pickers, um, you know, have to use a lot of skill and a lot, of, a lot of judgment. And it takes a lot as a winemaker to be there vigilantly watching and helping and coaching and making sure that we just only pick the fruit that's perfectly at the level of sugar that we want. And so there's, um, can you say approximately what degrees bricks you're picking these at? Yeah, so this was in 2014, we we're about 32 bricks. Wow. That's right. Semillon, yeah. yeah. And the wine is about uh, 12 percent alcohol 12 and a half and so natural yeast or some cultured yeast or is it uh, i'm just always fascinated because obviously the higher the sugar level the more potential alcohol but yeast can't live in usually above 16 17 percent so right the yeast die and you're left with this kind of high alcohol but also some sugar left in the wine yeah so 12 and a half are you is that natural yeast uh, it's it's not natural yeast actually. It's an added um, an added yeast, but it was selected from a native yeast fermentation okay. know, at some point in its in its past. Sure. And then realized that that fermentation was great, right? So then it gets propagated, and um, we're able to add it. 
Uh, but it does have the same, you're, you're absolutely right. Like there's a certain point where the alcohol starts to be fatal to the yeast and actually the sugar starts to be fatal to the yeast. So there's an equilibrium that gets reached um, because it, like, like honey, for instance, right, never goes bad. You can store honey for thousands of years and it's that sugar that's protecting. Um, Same thing that's a preservative in, in these wines and the wines of Sauternes yeah. and things like that. that you know, these uh, exactly. TBAs from Germany and things like that, they go forever. Yeah. But it's the sugar and the acidity that helps them. And I, I, didn't, I didn't know that sugar was something that helped preserve the wines as well. But now that you say honey, absolutely makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. It, there's a lot of talk even of like champagne and dosage, right? And oh, yeah. champagnes that have higher dosages we know are aging better. And so the, we're, we're actually still learning a lot about the effect of sugar on oxidation of wine um, and the ageability of wine. But it's definitely part of it. But this color is just yeah, always well, mesmerizing to me. How huh? you get the yellow and the green and... Yeah, almost, I mean, honey-like as well, but there's that little tinge of green in there that... Well, there's more florals again. I mean, honeysuckle and uh, jasmine, yeah. and, uh, but you know, kind of pineapples and all these really great tropical fruits. Absolutely, this is, this is incredible. Absolutely, a lot of mango in there. Um, there is almost a hint of, of vanilla as well, although mm -hmm. I just think it's the naturally the ripeness of the fruit. It's, it's not. not it's not the oak vanilla. It's yeah, yeah. It's the natural natural vanilla like extract kind of. Yeah, and good acidity for um, for balance. Um, that's a great way to, to end the tasting. Man, uh, get all of them, people. <laughs> all really delicious. Uh, anything you want to say about the, the site here? I mean, you've, you've talked a lot about the different vineyards and everything. It's 112 acres total, but only, I think, what, uh, 12 are planted? Uh, it's, Maybe yes. More. Yeah, yeah, about yeah. 12 acres planted total but that's between the two sites. Hillside. I mean, so a lot less vines per acre because... You can't plant them so close together as you can on the valley floor. So um, yields are a lot less. Yeah. Uh, grapes are a lot smaller. Uh, so we're not getting huge amounts of fruit, but very, very intense fruit. Um, and along with the other wines that are being made here, vineyard sites that uh, Mike's told you about tonight, uh, today, uh, everything's done on a microscopic level, which is, I think, really, really incredible. And uh, Man, I've had a great morning. I'm ready to conquer the day now. <laughs> this is, this is, this is great. Um, um, I want to thank Frank and Julie Husick for obviously allowing us to come and taste on their beautiful property and share these delicious wines with us. And, uh, Mike, I know you're super, super busy guy. So thank you very, very, very much for agreeing to meet me at this dreadful location uh, and uh, and uh, taste these wines. And um, uh, I hope you all are doing it. We all hope you're doing well out there. We miss you here in Napa. We can't wait to, uh, to see you again out here. Uh, uh, so make your plans uh, whenever we're allowed to travel again. Um, make sure to contact us. Come see Mike over at uh, uh, Relic. Uh, come see me here. Uh, we are anxious to see you all again and uh, hope you stay healthy and safe. Uh, cheers, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Scotty. Mike. Yeah, thank you for having me and everybody. Take care out there. Hope that you're well and your loved ones are well. And uh, we do miss you a lot. And um, hopefully we'll get to see you soon. Cheers, guys. Um, another quick shout out to um, the, the folks over at Corbin, Greg Lambrick in particular, the inventor of this apparatus. Uh, this is the Model 11, which is um, the Bugatti, if you will, of uh, the Corbin, and it's really incredible. Uh, he was actually kind enough to put together this uh, little video for us that we're going to add in right now. So, uh, Greg, leave it to you. Thanks, Scotty. I uh, really appreciate it and uh, really appreciate you and all you've done for Coravin and for my own cellar. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick demonstration of the Model 11 that you're showing uh, with two of the wines that I have purchased from you while with you in the vineyard, uh, Adler Deutsch and the Boitsch family. So this is our Coravin Model 11, I guess the Bugatti of Coravin. That will now be its new nickname. Um, and it pours wine from any bottle that you own without opening it. Uh, we also, I also have the Model 6 here, which I'll show, but you simply push it down, tip it sideways, and it pours itself. I've got it on taste mode, so I can pour a small amount just to see what it's like. If I want to pour a glass, I can do that as well. So I'll pour a small amount there, pull it off, and of course, bottle reseals, which is why Corbin's so magic. No air got in during the pouring process. I'm going to smell this. This is 2011. 
Adler Deutsch. That's such a beautiful place too. You sit there, you're looking out into the vineyards from the vineyard home, and it is freaking stunning. Uh, and you know, and the wines are beautiful. I think I bought three different vintages from you. And that is delicious. So the other wine uh, is a 2016 Boich family Bextoffer Vineyard, George III, Napa Valley. I'm going to show you the less than Bugatti. We'll call this the Maserati of uh, Corbin. It's a Corbin Model 6. Same thing, press it down, tip it sideways, press and pour. I'm going to pour myself a little bit more of this one. I'm going to save the 11 for later. But this thing is so freaking delicious. So that's uh, that's the Corbin. Corbin pushes wine out of the bottle without letting any air in. We use an inert gas argon to push the wine from the bottle. Instead of sucking it out, we push the wine out. Uh, and that's why um, uh, the wine is not oxidized. It doesn't get any air in the bottle. And all that wine that I just removed has now been replaced with, with argon. And the cork is elastic, uh, so it reseals. So you can put it back in your cellar and drink it again next week, next month, even next year. Scotty, I cannot wait to buy more wine from you because I know that whenever I'm buying wine from you, I'm somewhere next to you and we're somewhere beautiful out in Napa uh, or the surrounding. So uh, can't wait until we're on the other side of this thing. Thank you so much, Greg, really appreciate it. Love your devices, uh, it actually helps us a lot in the hospitality industry. And so um, really, really appreciate you uh, making time for us. Uh, thank, thank you so much. much.